So last time we looked at equimolar counter diffusion. This time we're going to look at another common scenario you can model early on in your study of transport phenomena. It is diffusion through a stagnant gas or a stagnant film. So your situation essentially looks like this. You have a beaker of some volatile component. In this case, we're going to use benzene. And then we have some gas that is above that, um, and that is air. And there is a membrane here, a film, if you will, um, at the interface so that they meet, and diffusion can occur through that film. So benzene can essentially evaporate upwards at this interface and disappear. And the air is stagnant, and we'll talk about the ramifications of that momentarily. So for now, I'll say that the air we're going to call species A, and the benzene we're going to call species B. And since the air is stagnant, that means it essentially won't move while the benzene evaporates. So as the benzene molecules move upward in the air, the air is not going to be perturbed by that movement. Okay, so again, the way we start pretty much every single problem in transport phenomena is with the diffusion convection equation. So diffusion convection equation. And we're going to make the similar assumptions that we make pretty much every single time so far. First is that we're going to assume it's steady state. So this term will go to zero, and then we're going to assume there's no reaction. So while the benzene is moving through the air, um, the benzene is not going to be reacting with the air or reacting with itself. So no reaction term is going to happen here. We've got the same exact thing over here. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to say this. So implicitly here we have another assumption is that we're using a one-dimensional model or we're using rectilinear geometry or what is commonly known as Cartesian geometry. It's saying that the only movement that is possible is movement in the z-direction. So we're saying, okay, this is the z-direction vertically. The only movement that is happening is along the z-direction. We're not concerned about things moving to the left or right. We're just concerned about things moving up or down with our, our system. So here we've made those assumptions. And now, since the derivative of this with respect to z is going to be 0, that means that n sub b is again going to be constant, where n sub b is our total flux of species b, or sometimes referred to as the convective flux of species b. So now we're able to use our expression for the total flux of a species as being the sum of the diffusive flux as well as the advective flux. Uh, last time in the equimolar counter diffusion example, we talked about the discussion of whether we should use the expression of um, CB times the molar average velocity or the mole fraction Y sub B times the total flux. And here again is going to be a good situation where we want to use the total flux definition. So again, you need to be careful when choosing your definition of the total flux. In the case, we're going to use this. You'll see in a few moments why that is useful. So since it's a binary system, we could, we could open up this expression over here and say that the total flux is going to be uh, the flux with respect to A plus the total flux with respect to B. Now here is the key assumption. Uh, we said that the gas is not going to moving, the gas is stagnant. What that means is that the total flux of species A, which is the air, is going to be zero. So this is our key assumption. Again, this comes from the fact that the air is stagnant. Anytime a species is stagnant, you can make the assumption that the total flux of that species in the system is going to be zero. So again, the air is not moving, so there is no flux of the air in the system. Okay, where does that bring us? Well, we could cross off this n sub a term over here in the advective flux and say that um, the total flux is going to be equal to the diffusive flux plus the advective flux, where the advective flux is simply the mole fraction of B times its total flux. Again, kind of weird, but it's an idea you're going to need to get used to. What we're going to want to do after that is we're going to want to group terms on this side, and we're going to want to get our total flux again as a function of everything else. So I've made this line red because it's an important line. We're going to come back to it later. But for now, where do we proceed from here? 
Well, we have the mole fraction of species B, and again, we have the diffusive flux. Usually what we do at this point is we invoke fixed first law. So we're gonna invoke fixed first law here, and again, notice that we have this derivative with respect to Z. That means we're already assuming that fixed first law is going to be one dimensional and a rectilinear in nature, or Cartesian, rather. So now you can make the substitution. Well, we're going to want to make one alteration before that. See how this is in terms of the mole fraction and this is in terms of concentration. We want them to be the same. So here we're going to pull out the total concentration so that we could have a um, mole fraction here in the differential. Okay, now once we've done that, we can now make the substitution of fixed first law into our flux equation. So now we have the total flux um, with this y sub b over here, and we also have this y sub b over here. But now it's in the form of a differential equation that we're going to attempt to solve. Grouping terms or separating variables, we get that the dz can be over here. There's no z dependence on any of these terms. And over here, we have the y sub b. Now remember, diffusivity is a constant. Um, the concentration in the system, we're going to assume, is going to be relatively constant. Um, and the molar flux of B, we're going to assume, is going to be constant, because that's what we found from the diffusion convection equation and our assumptions earlier up. So for now, what we're going to do is we're going to say all of these are constants. We're going to lump them together, because we don't actually know what their value is. And we're just going to call it K sub naught, um, just so we don't attribute any value to this just yet. It's dangerous when you typically do that. Now that we've done that, what we need to do is we need to do the indefinite integral of both sides. Um, there's a little bit of nuance here. So why don't you want to do the definite integral of the boundary conditions yet? Well, we'll discuss that a little bit later. But for now, trust me, you're going to want to do the indefinite integral, not the definite integral. At this point, now you're going to do a little bit of calculus. So over here, the integral of dz is simply going to be z. The integral of this species, you could solve by u substitution and get that it's going to be negative ln of this. Uh, since we did the indefinite integral, we have to add on another constant over here. That's the k1 that you find right over there. Um, now I'm going to change these constants a little bit. Notice that there's a prime next to them. That's just because we rearranged everything. And now we've started grouping negative signs in here. So we don't have to worry about them. So basically I move this K1 over to the other side and I multiply by negative one. And I said, all right, just include the negative one in these constants so we don't have to worry about it. Okay, now we talk about boundary conditions. So back over here, let's bring this down. We need to discuss boundary conditions to find solutions for these constants. So the way we're going to model it is we're going to call this point here. We're going to say that's 0. And this point here, that's the top of the glass. We're going to call that L. So say this is uh, the initial z position at the interface. And this is the final z position. And we're going to assume the concentration throughout all here is constant. So that the concentration at the interface between the benzene and the air is going to be some value that is representative of the entire um, pure species. So again, our boundary conditions now are going to be at z equals 0 and z equals L. Um, just to keep it as general as possible, we're just going to say, um, OK, when z equals 0, the mole fraction is going to be some initial value. And at z equals L, the mole fraction is going to be some later value. We're not going to specify if this is 0, if this is 0. We're just going to say, leave them as is for now. We want a general solution, or as general a solution as possible. So now we need to use these boundary conditions to be able to solve this. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. So the first boundary condition um, is pretty much going to kill this first term here. And we're going to get k1 equals that. All right, well, that's cool. That wasn't too bad. So the second boundary condition, once we incorporate it in here, is going to look like this. So again, I guess that should be an L really, but no, I haven't subbed it in yet. Okay, so we've already subbed in this first boundary conditions. Now we're going to do the second one. What we get when we do that 
is this. So I move this over to the other side. I subtracted this. Uh, remember your oh, let's just probably move this down. Uh, remember your definitions when it comes to handling log terms is that I combine these in the same if they're being subtracted. So that's what I did there. And then I subbed in the value of z equals l. And I got that this k naught constant is going to be equal to this mess here. Again, the mathematics isn't really important, so if you're um, a little lost, it doesn't really matter, because um, this is just a bunch of algebraic manipulations. So now that I've solved for both these constants, k1 and k0, I'm going to take this expression here, I'm going to put those in, and this is what I'm going to get. So perhaps I should group those so that they're a little bit easier for you to read. Boundary condition 1 got us k1, boundary condition 2 got us k0. This was our original uh, profile, and now this is our profile with all the substitutions that we've made. Uh, the next trick that we're going to use to simplify this a little bit is we're going to move the z over here. Just uh, as, a, I guess, a preparation step, really. And then we're going to do some shenanigans. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract this term over to the other side. So that we could put it in the denominator of this term. And then one of your rules of logs says um, we could basically take this and put it in here and raise whatever is in here to the power of that. So now both sides are simply in terms of logs. So we can just undo the log. And this will be our final profile, a final concentration profile. Uh, so to make that a little bit more explicit, you're like, there's too many variables here. Uh, we really just want the mole fraction of species B as a function of where you are along in the beaker. So y b is now a function of z. Everything else is a constant. L is a constant. Y b l is a constant. Y b naught is a constant. Don't worry about that so much. Okay, so now we have the concentration profile. The other thing that we're always interested in is getting the, the flux. Okay, so this is where things can go very, 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 very wrong if you don't know exactly the tricks that you need to do. So here are the tricks. Remember this line all the way up here that I put in red. This is the line that you're going to want to use because, again, you want to get um, n sub b. And you need to be very careful because remember you stated earlier on, way, way at the beginning of the problem from our diffusion convection equation, that n sub b is a constant. So any solution that you get where n sub b is not a constant um, with respect to distance is going to be a problem. So we, uh, then we're going to again use fix first law and go back to this line here. Okay, so now the confusing part is why did we visit this line again? And I'm telling you the reason we visit this line is a trick. Originally, remember, we grouped these together as a constant and continued on that way. But this time, we're actually going to perform the integration again, but this time we're going to do the definite integral. Again, it's going to be confusing why we're doing that, but just know that this is a trick that you're going to have to get used to. Um, it simplifies your problem a lot. So once we do the definite integral from 0 to L and from y naught to y sub L, what we're going to get is the following. This is pretty much just delta z, so it's L minus 0. And over here, um, when you solve this, you're going to get something that looks like this. OK, now we have negative signs on both sides. They cancel. And we have a final expression for our flux. OK, and this is what's important. Notice, if you remember the solution for the thin film diffusion, how similar this is. They're both constants, right? Because C, we said, was a relatively constant. L is a constant. It's just the length of the beaker. The diffusivity is constant. Uh, these mole fractions that you find at the beginning and end of your system are going to be constant. So notice how similar it is to the thin film diffusion example, right? Because this was our solution at the end of the thin film diffusion. So in general, what you're going to get is some form of d over l times a concentration difference. So this 
over here when we're doing this problem is your concentration difference. This, when you're doing the thin film diffusion problem, is your concentration difference. If you get to the end of your transport modeling and you find that your mass well, your, your flux expression isn't d over L times some concentration difference. Uh, you probably went wrong somewhere along the way. Okay, so again, this is your final solution as far as your flux for the problem. If you want to put that in the notes, uh, that's what you should put down. The other thing we're going to want to look at more closely is this concentration profile over here. Um, again, it's a complicated expression, so you're probably like, I don't know what this actually looks like. Uh, I don't know why this is important. I don't know what the significance of this is. So let's look about that for a moment. So again, when we solved this stagnant film problem, this was your final expression. And this is what we just got from doing this example. Um, if you could have solved the problem differently, that goes back to this line up here where we have the original expression for the total flux. Um, now you might remember from last time when we did equimolar counter diffusion, when we solved it that way, we said that the flux overall was going to be zero and that the two fluxes in here would cancel out. And what that resulted in was this. That the total flux was going to be approximately the diffusive flux. The other way that we could solve it is we could say that it's very dilute um, in terms of what we're looking at. So if we're looking at B in this example, we could say it's dilute in B, so YB is small. And then if we make that assumption, we get the exact same result. So remember if YB is small, much smaller than diffusive flux, we could essentially ignore it like that. And other way you get the result that the diffusive flux is about equal to the, um, total flux is about equal to the diffusive flux. But notice what we had over here when we did the stagnant film example. What we got was this expression. This expression is different from this expression, so we'd expect a different concentration profile at the end of our modeling. What we get if we do this equimolar diffusion example um, is the exact same thing that we had for the thin film, right? It's just the linear concentration profile that we've seen several times. So over here, this is our thin film solution written in terms of concentration. Um, I've rearranged it so uh, it's going to be pretty much in the form of a downward sloping line. And I've also basically divided out by total concentration so that we can get everything in terms of mole fraction. So let me get rid of these and focus on this. So now we have the thin film solution that comes from either the equimolar counter diffusion assumption or the dilute concentration assumption. And now we have the stagnant film profile that comes from the assumptions that we made um, in this lecture. The difference is that they will look like this. When you had the equimolar counter diffusion or the dilute concentration, you got a linear profile for the mole fraction of species B. That's this dotted line here. When you have the stagnant film or the stagnant gas that we had, um, the air in there, it allows you to better model or more realistically model the diffusion that happened here. And that's why you get this curve that looks like this. So really um, the mathematics in here, all this mess isn't really important. What you need to be remembering if you want to be um, good at mass transfer problems is the assumptions that you used uh, to get to your final solution, why you made those assumptions, and how those assumptions are going to impact your final concentration profile and your final flux, which in this case was this for the stagnant film.